quick before I bring Dr. Peter Wins to the front. He's going to do what he's got to do. I would like that before you start praying for the people, we're going to receive an offering for you. And then um, after that, you can do whatever you want. You can stay here till midnight if you want. But uh, let us do that. And let us, uh, are you guys ready? Yes, you guys ready? Yes. Give him a warm South Florida welcome. Dr. Peter Wins. You're talking about a bunch of generations of blessings. The grandson of Derek Prince. Great man of God. God bless you, sir. Good evening. It's great to be with you. Please be seated. I've got a lot to share with you. And at the end of the time of sharing, we will see about interpreting some of your dreams. Uh, because I want to teach you how to interpret your dreams. I've been interpreting dreams for more than 30 years for people. And just this past few months, I wrote a book on it because so many people from all over the world were contacting me to have their dreams interpreted, um, like 10 a day. And uh, sometimes they were writing pages and pages. And so I thought, I need to write a book to teach people how to interpret their own dreams. So I wrote this book, and you can get it at the back there. Joy, would you stand up? That's uh, my wife as for 47 years. And she's my first wife, and uh, my last. <laughs> so there's other books there, and you can also put your name on a list, and we'll send you a teaching every month. So this book is called Dreams, Visions, and Revelations, and How to Interpret Them. And a lot more is in the book than what I can share with you tonight. But I will do my best to give you as much information in the time that we have as possible. So to start off with, let's go to a book of Numbers, chapter 12, and I want to read to you verse 6. So Numbers, chapter 12, starting, I'm going to start in verse 5. It says, then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. When both of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When a prophet of the Lord is among you, I reveal myself to him in visions. I speak to him in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly, and not in riddles. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we welcome the increased power of the Holy Spirit. Now, you are the teacher here tonight. And we ask that you would take us further into your purpose and into your calling. Lord, let your power be among us and let change come. We speak it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So dreams are given to us more than 200 times in the Bible. And every dream in the Bible comes from God. Even dreams that sinners had, such as Pharaoh with the dreams of the cows coming out of the river. Or Nebuchadnezzar having a dream that nobody could answer and he wanted to kill all his wise men if they didn't tell him the dream and the interpretation. It haunted him. And even Pilate's wife, just before Jesus was crucified, said, do not harm this man because I was troubled last night in a dream because of him. Every dream in the Bible comes from God. I don't say that every dream that a person has comes from God. But if you're a Christian and you're walking with the Lord, then I'll tell you right now that every dream that you have will be from God. Now, if you're watching horror movies or if you're involved in witchcraft or worshiping other gods, then you open yourself up to all kinds of things, and you can have dreams from demons. But if you're walking, as you should be, as a daughter or son of the living God, then every dream that you have will be from him. Even the dreams that seem nasty, there's a purpose with every dream that the Lord gives you. 
You might think that dreams are only important in the Old Testament, but not so. In fact, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when these disciples were speaking in other languages and preaching the gospel to them about Jesus Christ in their own tongue, they said, these men must be drunk. And Peter stood up and said, these men are not drunk like you think. But this is the fulfillment of the prophet Joel, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And then he says, your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Maybe if you're not getting enough dreams, you're not old enough. I don't know. I'm getting lots of them. At any rate, this is not just for men. It's for women too. But here with the impartation of the Holy Spirit, it wasn't just speaking in tongues. And it wasn't just prophesying. But one of the signs of the move of the Holy Spirit in our time is that you will receive dreams. You will receive visions from the Lord. And there is such an increased anointing for dreams and visions in the world right now and in the body of Christ. Because we're coming closer and closer to the end of the age and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the church needs to be ignited with the fire of the Holy Spirit. We need revival in America, and we will have revival in America. But not unless the church starts to grow up and becomes more spiritual. So you see, God doesn't want to just teach you while you're awake. He wants to teach you while you're sleeping. He said, Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That means when you're sleeping, he doesn't take a vacation. He doesn't leave you. He is there with you. In fact, during the daytime, you have so many distractions. You're shopping, you're at work, you're looking after children, you're fussing over the problems of other people. But when you're asleep, God has your undivided attention. And he can speak to you. But if you think that your dreams are just because you had too much pizza last night, <laughs> then why would God speak to you? Why would he give you something so vital and so important if you just discard it? Almost every day I have somebody come up to me and say, I had a crazy dream. A dream, it's just, I know it doesn't mean anything, but can you please help me understand it? And they tell me this dream. And I say, I know exactly what that means. And before long, people start to tune in. And they start to say, here I am, Lord. Will you speak to me? Will you show me your ways? Will you teach me? See, the Lord will actually disciple you through your dreams. He'll take care of the good, the bad, and the ugly that's inside of you. He'll expose things and bring them to the surface for the purpose of sanctification in your life, for the purpose of his divine call on your life, for the purpose of the steps that you are soon to take, for the purpose of the ministry for other people, God will give you information in your dreams. Now, there are three kinds of dreams. There are obvious dreams where you don't need an interpretation. The Lord just tells you something straight up. Like Joseph, the husband of Mary. He found out she was pregnant before they got married. And he says, I'm not marrying that girl. She's been messing around. And that night, he has a dream. And in the dream, the angel comes and says, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. Because the child within her. It's from the Holy Spirit. It was a direct word. There was no need for an interpretation. That's what we call an obvious dream. But as we've just read here in the book of Numbers, that God speaks to his prophets in visions. 
He speaks to them in dreams. And then it says, he speaks to them with riddles. You might say, well, why would God speak to us in riddles? Why would there be a puzzle that we have to solve? And the reason is because God wants you to seek his face. He does, he's not Santa Claus. He just doesn't give you something. Now, sometimes he does. He just blesses you and gives you. But he wants you to wrestle with the angel of the Lord. He wants you to go after him. He wants to say, what does this mean, Lord? He wants your heart. And so he will speak to you in riddles, sometimes obvious dreams, sometimes dreams that are riddles. And the riddles are usually not complicated once you learn your dream language. Once you learn a few things, a few basic things, which you can find out very easily by reading the book. Then, then you can interpret the riddles. So there are obvious dreams. There are dreams that come to you in riddles that need your own. You can interpret them yourself. But then there are impossible dreams. And those are the dreams that you need supernatural miracles. A supernatural word from God to interpret. So Pharaoh has this dream. He's the king of Egypt. He's not a believer in the living God. And he sees in his dream seven fat cows come out of the river. And then he sees seven skinny cows come out of the river. And the skinny cows eat the fat cows. And they're still skinny. I wish I had that problem. <laughs> At any rate, he doesn't know what it means. And how in the world could you know what the, what the cows represent. It's not a riddle that you can solve unless you have a supernatural word from God. And he gets a word from Joseph. He brings him out of prison because two men, a baker and a butler, were in the prison and they both had dreams. And Joseph interpreted their dreams and they came true. And finally... Pharaoh was pulling out his hair, and he couldn't figure out this dream. And the butler said, well, there was this guy in prison, and he can interpret dreams. So he had him brought before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, the God of creation can tell you what this dream means. And then he told him, the seven fat cows are seven years of great harvests in the land. You're going to have such abundance but then there'll be seven years of famine and it will destroy everything. And Pharaoh says, what are we going to do? And Joseph gives him a word of wisdom and says, we store up the grain in the good years so that we have it for when the famine comes. Now the reason for most of those kind of dreams where you need a word, a supernatural word from God to interpret is because God wants to make a connection. He wants to connect you with a powerful minister of the Lord. In this case, Pharaoh needed to connect with Joseph because Joseph needed to become the prime minister of Egypt in order to save his people from genocide. It happened also with Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. Only Nebuchadnezzar forgot his dream. In the middle of the night, you should have a journal beside your bed. Because when in the middle of the night you wake up and you know you had this power dream from God, and, but you're tired, and you say, oh, I'll think about it in the morning. In the morning, it's gonzo. It, you can't remember. You say, I know I had a dream. It was a great dream. I know it was from God. It was gone. But if you will just have a pen beside your bed and a little journal, and if you just write one or two things, you don't have to write the whole thing out. You just write, I saw a lion in my dream, and he was protecting me, and go back to sleep. In the middle, in the, in the morning, you'll have to understand what you wrote because it'll look like a chicken walked on the piece of paper. 
but it will remind you, and God will remind you of your dream. Well, this is what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. He couldn't remember his dream, but it haunted him. He knew it was important, and he threatened to kill every wise man in the whole nation if they couldn't tell him the dream that he had. And they said, just tell us what the dream was, and we'll give you an interpretation. And he said, no, I want you to tell me what the dream was. Yeah, and then they said, we never had anybody ask us such a question. And they were going to kill everybody, including Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and all the wise men. And Daniel heard about it, and he said, let me come before the king. And they brought him before the king, and the king said to Daniel, can you, can you tell me what my dream was? He says, I cannot tell you, but the God of creation can tell you. And he went and sought the Lord, and then he came back, and he says, I'll tell you what your dream was. There was a statue that had a head of gold and silver uh, shoulders and breast and then iron and clay. And uh, he said, then a mountain, a rock that was taken out of a mountain came and crushed the whole thing. And Nebuchadnezzar said, that was my dream. And he says, now let me tell you what it is. You're the golden head. But after you're finished, another kingdom will come. And it will be of silver, and then one of bronze, and then one of iron, and one of iron and clay. And these are the nations of the world and the history of the world. But at the end of it all, the kingdom of God will come and take over every kingdom and smash every kingdom. And that kingdom of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Now, this dream is still being fulfilled today. The dream was given to a powerful sinner. It wasn't given to a Christian. It was given to Nebuchadnezzar. The dream of the history of humanity was given to him. But God wanted Daniel to connect with that king. So, I want to tell you now about the difference between dreams, visions, and revelations. This is very important. A lot of people have prophetic gifts, and they should. The Bible says that all of you can prophesy. And some of you are prophets of the Lord. And you have a special gift to speak the word of the Lord that will open the doors for the future, and involve the gift of knowledge in people's lives. It's not for sensationalism. It's to bring the fear of God and to release the purpose of the Lord. But many people who have prophetic gifts will say, I have a vision. And they might say something like, I saw the church building filled with angels and there were angels all around the property here and the power of God was moving and people were being healed now it may be a vision but it probably wasn't a vision it probably was a revelation and a revelation is very different the Bible says when you come together every one of you should come with a gift of the Holy Spirit to bring and some of you will have a song, and some of you will have a word, and some of you will have a revelation. But it's not a vision. A vision is something that's not in your mind. It's not in your mind's eye. A vision is something you see like a dream. It actually appears in front of you. So when we go to the book of Acts, chapter 10, we read of a place where this actually happens. In Acts chapter 10, we read about Peter, and it says in verse 9, Acts chapter 10, verse 9, about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Would you say trance? Yeah. So falling into a trance 
isn't just something that witches and warlocks do. It's actually right here in the Bible. And Peter falls into a trance. And he says this. In verse 11. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth. Jews can't eat iguanas. And birds. And a voice told him, get up and eat. And the, Peter said, surely not. I've never eaten anything unclean. And this happened three times. Take a look at verse 17. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision. So this is a vision. This is not just a revelation. It's not just an idea that he had in his mind. He saw this. He fell into a trance. It's only happened to me a few times in my life. And he saw it. And we find in verse 19, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said, there's three men looking for you. They're at the door. And he went and he found out they weren't Jews. And at this point, the gospel had only been given to the Jews. But things were about to change. And the Lord was going to release the message of the kingdom and the gift of salvation and the Holy Spirit beyond the Jewish nation. He was going to give it to the Italians. And then from there to the nations of the world. Even to the people in your nation. So this vision that Peter had was designed by God to get him ready to break the mold and to go to the next step to begin to preach the gospel to people of other nations. And from that point on, the gospel went from nation to nation and it hasn't stopped. It's gone to the ends of the world. It's the reason why I'm here and why churches are all over this land and all over the nations. It's because of this vision that Peter had. So when you get a word from the Lord, if you don't go into a trance and see something, actually see it, then don't call it a vision. Call it, say, I had a revelation from the Lord. There's a, there's a reason for this. Because if you have a vision where you actually go into a trance and you see something come up before your eyes and you see it like so real, like, it, like a dream, it will stay with you for the rest of your life. It will be so definitive and so powerful. But if you have a revelation... You need to be aware that it may just be your good idea. A lot of people, I think, give a word from the Lord, which actually didn't come from the Lord. And I don't call them false prophets. I just call them wrong prophets. Because false prophets are enemies. But these people aren't enemies. Yeah, they really meant well. That's exactly right. So they're wrong so that's why prophets get judged. It said, judge the prophecy. So when you have a revelation, expect it to be judged. But if you have a vision, it's powerful. And dreams are very powerful. Now there's two kinds of dreams I want to tell you about. One is what I call a casual dream, and the other one is a power dream. So, if I get up a lot in the night, every time I get up, I just had a dream. I can have 10 dreams in one night. If I study every dream to figure out all the details, I won't do anything else in my life. They will consume me. I will be... A dreamaholic. Yeah. But most of those dreams are casual dreams. 
They give me a little tweak, a little word from God. And they're so common. Because it's the same with when I'm awake. That God's speaking to me all the time. There's hardly a moment when I'm walking or driving or talking with somebody that the Holy Spirit is not speaking to me. It's just continuous. And it's just a lifestyle. Well, most dreams enter into my world that way. They're called, I call them, casual dreams. They're meaningful, but they don't need a lot of my attention. By the time I'm finished brushing my teeth, I've gone on to other things. But a power dream is different. Those are the dreams, like Nebuchadnezzar has, that won't leave him alone. And if you get a dream like that, you will remember it, and you will want to know what it means, and God will be unfolding the meaning of that dream in three months from now. He'll still be giving you details. Because those kind of dreams have amazing significance for your life. So, power dreams you should spend a lot of time on. And I would recommend that you write down your power dreams in a journal, in a dream journal. But differentiate them from casual dreams, which are important, but not as important. Now, in order for you to interpret your dreams, one of the keys to focus on is to understand what kind of dream it was. And in my studies of the Bible, I've discovered seven kinds of dreams. If you can determine what kind of dream it is, you can better know how to interpret it. For example, if you have a teaching dream, then you say, Lord, what are you wanting to teach me? If you have a warning dream where a bear is chasing you, and he wants to eat you, and you wake up in a panic, you realize this was a warning dream, then you ask, Lord, what are you warning me about? What is coming to attack me or my family? So every time you have a dream, you should respond to the dream. If you have a dream about a wolf or a bear chasing you, it's probably a warning dream, but you shouldn't wake up and focus on how frightening it was and how much you're afraid and be in a mess because of your dream. You should be in step with the Lord and saying, Lord, something is after me. Thank you for the warning. Thanks for exposing it. Now show me what it is. And in the name of Jesus, you spirit of the bear, I rebuke you. I command you to leave this house and to leave my family. And sometimes when you get a dream like that, you need to get a key from the Lord to break its power. I'm a Jewish person. My mother was born in Israel. I'm her firstborn from the tribe of Levi. So I am a New Testament Jewish priest. And the Bible says to the Levites was given the authority to distribute the holy fire. So I do that. But I remember this man coming and sitting in our congregation for well over a year. And I went out for breakfast with him, and he was anti-Semitic, which means he hated Jewish people. And I said, what in the world are you doing in this church? I'm Jewish. I preach about God's blessings for Israel all the time. And we pray over Israel every Sunday. And he says, well, I like to learn about the other things that you teach. 
But this man was real trouble. But he was a good artist, and I'm a good artist too. And so we compared paintings, and we had this fundraiser, and we brought some of our paintings in and sold them. And I bought one of his paintings. And I took it up and put it in my house. It was a beautiful painting. One day, it was a painting of, of these fish. And they were like angel fish, bright colors, and there was some brain coral down at the bottom, and they're kind of swimming towards this coral. And my son-in-law is a powerful man of God. He looks up and he says, Dad, there's words on the brain coral in that painting. And we looked at it real close, and it said, Jews must die. Well, it was within the same period of time that I had three dreams. And if you get a dream more than once, the same message in a dream, you need to pay attention. If you get it three times, it is really, really important. It's a power dream. And within 10 days, I had a dream where a doctor was in the first dream, a nurse and a healthcare person. Practitioner was in the third dream, and all of them said, Sir, you have cancer. It was at the same time that I traveled to Israel. All of these things came together. And a doctor came with us on our trip to Israel. And while I'm standing there out in the field teaching, he was standing beside me, and he came up to me after, and he said, Dr. Peter, you have uh, something in your ear. And I'm pretty sure it's cancer. You should get it taken care of when you get home to the United States. So all of these things, with the painting, my three dreams, and this doctor's superficial diagnosis, all happened like within the month. I came home, I never went to a doctor, I just got some oil and I anointed the inside of my ear and the thing fell out in a month. Yeah, it was, uh, it was great. And uh, he lives up in Indiana and I said, when I'm, I phoned him and told him and he says, no, 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 no. And I, and I said, yes, 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 yes. And I said, I'm coming up there to preach and you can check me out. So he did and true, it was clean, it was gone. Praise God. But during this time, after I had this first dream, and the doctor said, Mr. Wins, you have cancer. I got up in the middle of the night, and I was in a sweat, and I went and I prayed, and I read some scripture, but it felt like my prayers, I rebuked this thing, but it felt like my prayers just dropped to the ground. And uh, four days later, you know, I went back to bed. Four days later, I had the same dream, and I got up, and I had the same experience. It's like my prayer was not having effect. And then I had a third dream about a week later. And I got up, and I went into the living room, and I started to wrestle with God. And I said, God, you've got to show me what to do because this thing is still lingering. And I need the keys to unlock this thing and break the power of this curse. The Bible says, bring not the abominable thing into your house, lest you become like it. Amen. So be careful about dragons on your wall. Be careful about Harry Potter books. Be careful about the movies that you watch. Be careful about rings with snakes on them. Or tarot cards or a Buddhist doll. Yeah. Because all of these things become doorways for demonic activity. And some of you may need Jesus to come and clean your house. It's not worth it. If you have a gold ring from the Freemasons, get rid of it. Melt it down. Yeah. So, I woke up after this third dream and I prayed and prayed, and then I went and I opened up my Bible, and there was the story. You know, I played Bible bingo. I just opened it up and went, Lord, God, to speak to me. And there, the Lord spoke to me. 
And this prophet of the Lord, Ehud, went to this king, Eglon, who's this big fat guy. And he said, I have a word from God for you. Now, this was an enemy of, of God, this king. And he said, all right. He said, but I have to tell you alone. So the guards left, and he had the sword in his robe. And he went up. He says, I'm going to whisper in your ear. And he took the sword. And he said, this is the word of the Lord. And he stuck the sword, and he killed this guy. And then he went out off the balcony and fled. And when I read this story, the spirit of the Lord came on me. And I said, you spirit of cancer, in the name of Jesus, I destroy you. I break your power. I cut you off. I put you to death in Jesus' name. And the power of the Lord came. And that's when that thing fell out of my ear that week. So there's a response that you need for your dreams. So the first kind of dream I want to tell you about is a teaching dream. And I, I could take you through the Bible and show you the different places in the Bible where God gives teaching dreams. I would just tell you about it. Because if we go and read the scriptures, it's going to take too long. But King Solomon had a dream. And in his dream, God says to him, ask me what you want. And in the dream, Solomon says, I want to be wise to rule the people well. And God in his dream says, because you haven't asked for money or fame, but you've asked for wisdom, I will give you wisdom plus all the other things. And then it says, and he woke up from his dream. Now this was one of the greatest teaching dreams of all times. Because he learned what God wanted him to learn. He learned that of all, the other, of all the things he could ask for, it wasn't how to get rich. It wasn't how to be famous. It wasn't how to have his enemies destroyed. It was to have God's wisdom. But many people preach a sermon and say, Solomon was the wisest man because he asked God for wisdom. Well, actually, he didn't. God did it through him in a dream. He didn't even know what was going on until he woke up. But then he learned the priorities. And God blessed him and gave it to him. Now, God has given me so many teaching dreams. Sometimes he has given me an entire sermon where he's given me the theme, the title, three points, the scriptures, and the stories to tell. And I woke up and wrote them down and preached them the next Sunday, which is the easiest sermon I ever prepared. <laughs> but Einstein, he got a dream that helped him solve the problem of relativity and got the Nobel Prize because of it. And so did some of his other science friends get Nobel Prizes because of things they learned in their dreams. And Jack Nicholas changed his putter because he saw what to do in a dream. And George Harrison, one of the Beatles, who sung yesterday, All My Troubles Seem So Far Away, he got the whole tune from start to finish in a dream. And woke up, went to the piano, and played down what God gave him in a dream. So those are teaching dreams. The second kind of dream is a warning dream, which I've already mentioned to you. And it's all through the Bible. Do you know in Matthew chapter 2, within 10 verses, God gives four different dreams to Joseph, the husband of Mary. Four different dreams. He says, you should marry her in one dream. In the next dream, he says... Get the child and go to Egypt because Herod wants to kill the baby. In the next dream, he says, you can go back now because Herod is dead. And in the fourth dream, he says, go and live in Nazareth 
and raise the child there. So if God is giving dreams to the one assigned to protect and look after the Son of God, Jesus, don't you think he can direct your life with dreams? Joseph had a dream and it says, and immediately in the night he got up and fled to Egypt. And do you remember the wise men? They came and they went to Herod and they said, we've come to worship the king of the Jews. And he directed them towards Bethlehem and he said, when you find the baby, come and tell me so I may go and worship him too. He was a snake in the grass. Yeah. So that night after they worshiped the Lord, it says they were warned in a dream about Herod's Herod's intention to kill the child, and they went home a different way. So warnings are very important. Don't get all wound up and get your shorts in a knot because you have a warning dream. God's blessing you. He's telling you the plans of the enemy. He's exposing the enemy so you can rebuke the devil so that you can cut him off at the pass, and so that you can redirect. He'll disciple you in your, in your dreams. So the first dream is a teaching dream, and the second dream is a warning dream. The third dream is a provision dream. And a provision dream is when God will show you his provision for your life. Pharaoh's dream about the years of plenty was a provision dream. But it might be for your health. It might be for your ministry. I have had many provision dreams. One of them was when I was preaching up in Canada. And my wife was with me. And in the middle of the night, it was either God or an angel. But he yelled at me in my dream. So get ready. He said, look! And I jumped up just like that. If you were sleeping, you're awake now. <laughs> Go back to sleep. I jumped out of bed. My wife was still sleeping. I thought, how could she sleep through that? I looked out the window. I said, what am I supposed to see? Lord, what do you want me to look for? I opened my Bible. I didn't get any revelation. After 15 minutes, I went back to sleep. And then I had this amazing dream. And in the dream, I was in a restaurant. And I was waiting for my meal to come. And I looked over, and there at the door was an angel standing there. And he was a gentleman in a three-piece Armani suit. And you know things in a dream. Without explanation, I knew he was an angel. And he was just standing at the door, the metridi. And then another angel finally, after a long time, came in, and it was a lady. And she had this pedestal pizza tray. She was holding it. And on top was this beautiful supreme deluxe pizza with big chunks of meat and vegetables and thick cheese all over it. And she started to come towards me. And I thought, man, this looks good. And then she tripped. And the pizza went in slow motion in the air. And just before it hit the ground, the tray in her hand went, like in a cartoon, and caught the pizza. But now it was folded. And I'm looking at this in my dream. And then another angel came with a big punch bowl full of ice cream. And it was orange sherbet with clementine sections on top. And put it down in front of me. And I tried to make a joke with the angel in my dream. I said, I see we're having dessert first. Either the angel didn't get it, or he just wasn't in the mood for jokes. Because he didn't respond, just went over and stood. And then they brought the pizza back to me. And I woke up, and the presence of the Lord was all over me. And I knew this was a power dream. 
And I said, Lord, what is this? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, these are your provision angels. They are always with you. And they are there assigned to you to protect you, to help you find the path of God, to provide blessings for you, to bring special messages from me to you, and to help you fulfill your calling and destiny. And I said, thank you, Lord. And I was just in that bubble in the Holy Spirit, enjoying the glory of the Lord. And then I said, but Lord, why did the meal take so long to come from the kitchen? And what about this angel who tripped? I thought angels were more professional. And the Lord said, that's because you did not see the demons. Hindering the preparation in the kitchen or tripping the angel who was bringing the meal to you. I did not allow them to be seen in the dream or else you would have focused on the demons. And I only wanted you to focus on your provision angels. But know this. That when the answers to prayer are long in coming, or they come with hassle, it is because of demonic interference. So there are teaching dreams, and there are warning dreams, and there are provision dreams. And then there are flushing dreams. Now a flushing dream is when you have a dream that's so bad. When you wake up, you feel like you need a shower. It's perverted. It has something in the dream that you would never do. You don't like that. You, you don't think like that. But here you are engaged in this in your dream. And you might say, why in the world would you get a dream like this? Well, of course, the response is to rebuke the devil. But you don't know the schemes of the devil that are against you. And many a Sunday school child has ended up in witchcraft because they took some wrong turns, got with the wrong crowd, and opened themselves up to demonic activity and did things that they or their parents would never think they would do. But the devil is always overplaying his cards. And he has a scheme against you that is more dark and more evil than you can imagine. And when you have a flushing dream, and you wake up, and you rebuke that thing in the name of Jesus, it will get flushed out like flushing a toilet. And the enemy has no grounds and no place and no rights. So that's a flushing dream. And I'll read you a scripture about this. In the book of Job, we read in chapter 33 and verse 15. In a dream, in a vision of the night. A dream can be called a vision of the night. All right? Or a daydream could be called a vision. But they're different than a revelation. So, in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men as they slumber in their beds, God may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn man from wrongdoing and keep him from pride, to preserve his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. So sometimes the Lord allows a terrifying dream to come. When I was young, I had some of those dreams. I haven't had a fleshing dream now since I can remember. It's been so long. But this is one of those dreams 
Remember, your response should be for every kind of dream. A teaching dream, you give thanks. A warning or a flushing dream, you rebuke. A provision dream, you give thanks. And you look how you can cooperate with God to see it come to pass. Now, there are three more kinds of dreams. And I'm going to give them to you quickly. One is an apocalyptic dream. And these are dreams where things happen like the things that happen in the book of Revelation. You dream about a tsunami, an earthquake, a hurricane, collapsing buildings, tornadoes, things like that. More and more people are getting dreams like this. And you can find them throughout the Bible. Ezekiel had dreams like that. The whole book of Revelation is actually a vision. John didn't just have these ideas in his mind. He saw these things. It says, and then I looked and I saw, John says. And the vision, he was in a trance when he received the book of Revelation from God. And in it, he talks about it being a vision. And he sees all of these things happening. And more and more people are having apocalyptic visions and dreams. And when you have them and you wake up, it's because God is calling you to partner with him as an intercessor, to pray for his mercy, to pray for the work of the Holy Spirit into that situation. Sometimes you cannot share your dreams with other people. In fact, the Bible warns you to be very careful. There's about 20 verses in the Bible that says, be careful who you share your dream with because a person who is codependent, who is not secure in themselves, or who is an evil person or a controlling person can use your dream, if you're gullible, to get you to do something that God doesn't want you to do. So be careful who you share your dreams with. But an apocalyptic dream is there for you to pray. <clears throat> the sixth kind of dream is a glory dream. So the book of Genesis, we read in Genesis 28 and starting in verse 10. Genesis 28 and verse 10. Jacob left Bathsheba and set out for Haran. And when he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. <clears throat> Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a stairway rising on the earth and its top reaching to heaven. And the angel of God were descending, ascending, and descending. And there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants this land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. I am with you, says in verse 15. Verse 16, <clears throat> when Jacob awoke from the sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And he named it Bethel, the face of God. So, <clears throat> when you have a dream where you see Jesus or an angel or the throne room or a supernatural manifestation of God, it is because the Lord wants to increase your faith, let you know that you're very special to him. He wants to anoint you with his glory. For me, flying in my dreams is also a glory dream because it's so much fun. I don't want to wake up when I have 
a glory dream where I am flying. And there's three kinds of flying that I do in my dreams. One is the Superman move, where I put my hand above me and I just shoot straight up. And then there's another one where I just go up and I start soaring over the buildings and around the trees and I see people and people who I know most of the time. And the Lord shows me all kinds of things while I'm flying around and I actually control my flight. I see a tree and I say, I'm going to go real close to that tree and then just swoop over the tree. I mean, it's great. And then there's a third kind of <clears throat> flying where I have to flap my arms. And it's hard. I hardly get off the ground. Usually I'm being chased by something and I'm not flying high enough. <clears throat> and I say, what is this, Lord? <clears throat> but I usually get away. But when I have these dreams where I'm flying, I wake up and I actually think I can do it. It's so real. In fact, my dreams are so real that sometimes when I remember something, I don't know if it happened in real life or it happened in my dream. And I think, hmm, did that happen in my dream? And I get out of bed sometimes and I say, okay, I'm going to fly now. And it doesn't work. But it's part of my bucket list. I don't know about your bucket list. Maybe you want to do skydiving. I want to be taken up in a chariot, I want to walk on water, and I want to fly. No, that's my bucket list. And a few other things. <clears throat> so, those are glory dreams. Last kind of dream is a destiny dream. And we go back to the book of Genesis chapter 37 and verse 5. And this is what we read. Joseph had a dream. This is Joseph with the coat of many colors. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright and your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him the more because of his dream. Verse 9, then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. He is a slow learner. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to you to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept it in his mind. So if you have a destiny dream, it's about your future. I have had many of them. My life has been directed. The big things have been confirmed because of my destiny dreams. I moved to the United States 20 years ago because of a destiny dream. The building that we are in, which now can seat 3,000 people, the building is two acres on the roof and has 18 acres of land. We had no money, and we were a small congregation. And the banks wouldn't give us a loan. But we have the building, and it's our building. We're not renting it. But God showed me this in a destiny dream. So, when you get a destiny dream, be careful who you share it with or they may want to kill you. Because even though you say, well, I, you know, I didn't make up the dream. It wasn't me. It was God. They don't get that. If you share it, you're being proud, arrogant, and who in the world do you think you are? So, you only share it with very, very mature people. Or else they will misjudge you as if you're just trying to promote yourself. So you keep those destiny dreams. Why do you get them? Because in order for you to fulfill your destiny, 
you will have to take some very powerful steps of faith. And God will give you a destiny dream so you'll be able to do it. So if you know these seven kinds of dreams, it will be the first step in learning how to interpret your dreams. The first thing you do when you wake up is to be still. If you have a loud alarm clock, get a quiet one. The alarm clock will scare the dream right out of your head. And some people, they say, I don't dream. I never remember my dreams. We'll pray for you tonight and then you'll be having dreams. But you have to wake up and be still before the Lord. And you have to ask him to help you. He wants to know that you really want his word and that you're not playing games and that you're not just looking for sensationalism or for something so that you can tell good stories or grab attention. He wants to know that you're a kingdom of God person and you're in step with him. And if you are, he says he will bless you according to the size of your ears. If you are really listening, he will speak. And he'll speak more in the night than in the day. So I want to pray for you and interpret some dreams. Did you want to receive an offering at this time? Sure. Get ready with your dreams. If you would like me to interpret them, there are some conditions. I will just tell you about that. One, it has to be a dream that you've had within the last month or so. Because if you had it five years ago, it might not be important anymore. It might have already happened. Secondly, it has to be a dream that you can share in front of the people. So no rude dreams. No nasty kind of stuff. All right? Where you talk about other people or have some kind of personal experience that we shouldn't know about. And thirdly, your dream has to be short. You have to give me the details briefly so that we're not waiting here for 10 minutes while you tell this epic story in your dream. So if you have one of those dreams in a minute, we will uh, interpret your dreams. Let's uh, receive a love offering for Pastor Peter Wins. Are you enjoying this so far? I certainly am too. So um, we're going to... Um, you can give online here, and, uh, and the checks to rise up, and we're going to cut him uh, a check from the ministry's account. And so we want to bless him for his time here with us. Uh, and so um, do what you got to do to bless the man of God. Father, bless his offering that we're about to receive and prepare the atmosphere for what he's going to do with the interpretation of dreams. And let the spirit of the living God flow in this house in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>